Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Pork Dunn, who is professor at the UCD School of Physics and the academic lead of the UCD Science Phase 3. And we will chat about today that exact thing, the Phase 3, the UCD O'Brien Centre for Science. Hi, Pork. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Patricia. And you? I'm very well, thanks. Even better for speaking to you, Porik. So first question for you today, Porik, is where are you located and what's been keeping you sane during this lockdown? Well, at the moment, I'm sitting in Science North. I'm one of the few people in the building. Uh, I was here, I was at home, working from home until the end of October, and then I came back and where I'm working in the office more or less daily from then. I think keeping me sane, it's a good question. It's not really a case of being either sane or insane. It's somewhere along the line in between the two and trying to keep myself towards the sane end of that line, I suppose, exercise, nature, cooking, those sorts of things are what's keeping me and, you know, people. Yeah. I think we're all, we're all trying to do the exact same thing, Pork. So Pork, you are a professor of physics at ECD. Can you please tell the audience about your research in this role? And I suppose what makes you so passionate about what you do? Well, I'm uh, an experimental physicist, so I'm a gadget freak, really. And I like building experiments that are difficult enough to do, but when you get to interpret them, they're fairly unequivocal. They're giving good answers. And what I like about my work is that it, it's kind of like nature is there, and it's a case of investigating nature through experimental techniques and then seeing what's revealed. And in this case, it's using laser produced plasmas to study atoms and ions and plasmas. So it's, it's just revealing those things about the way the natural world is. That's what really I, I'm fascinated by. Fantastic, Pork. And uh, so just moving, I suppose, on to your title. Um, so maybe you could talk to us now about the Science Centre Phase 3 and your particular role in this. Well, I guess Phase 3 is, is sort of the culmination of a 15-year um, project or maybe a 20-year project whereby science has been the buildings we occupy have been refurbished and are being refurbished from the 1960s structure that was first in Belfield and opened in 1964. I think physics was the first school or department to occupy it. And so phase three is about taking the buildings in West and North, which is kind of earth sciences, biology, and then physics, math, computer science in North, and remodeling them and expanding them by about 5,000 square meters to make the whole center about a 65,000 square meter modern kind of Europe scale enterprise for education and research. And I so think, al yeah, yeah, yeah. Along those lines, I suppose, education and research. So I suppose I suppose everybody on the call would, would be wondering what what is what is this going to look like? Well, you know, it's not part of it's not going to look that different from how south the chemistry building has gone. So the building, one of the buildings, most likely west, is going to be widened and bigger floor plates brought in and north is most likely to be just refurbished in its current architectural form but gutted completely into just floor plates and columns and lift shafts and staircases and stuff and after that it'll be remodeled internally and recladded externally to bring it up to a kind of mid 21st century environmental performance I guess. I mean the buildings have to last for, have to function well for another 50 or 60 years and that's the kind of time scale we have to think about. Um, so it seems to me that there'll be the West building, most likely, as I say, the West building will be a heavily laboratory focused building and the North building will be more likely office and classroom and open space and circulation space focused. The final architectural design isn't complete and the final design design isn't complete, but they're coming along very quickly now. And there'll be a lot more, I think, in the next six weeks available information as soon as we get through the stage one design report. Great. And, and so it's just something you said there, Porg, about the next, the building has to last, I suppose, the next 50 years. But I really, I suppose, in terms of what it's going to be used for, and I suppose the educational plan, the societal plan around the building is really, you know, it's, it's a long term plan when we think of education. So maybe you might want to comment a little bit about, about that in terms of the Science Centre. Well, I think... I mean, I think in phase two and phase one, there was big changes in, say, the laboratory settings and in the classroom settings. The ALEs were brought into advanced learning environments, for example. I think in, in phase three, there'll be more advanced laboratories and very good, uh, high standard, fl flexible, forward looking laboratories. But I think it's the workplace and the learning spaces where there'll be new, new uh, developments and new growth. And I think the fact that we were designing in the middle of a pandemic and 
designing in the context of all these new learning and collaboration tools and all of that and all the remote working people are doing yeah. is definitely informing us. I'm very grateful that we didn't finish this project in 2020. Let me put it that way. Yeah, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions from our audience around that. So just to finish up, I suppose, with the chat between you and I, um, in Discovery, we're very, I suppose, we're very passionate about interdisciplinarity. And, and we are just wondering, in terms of going forward in the Science Centre, how important will that be? I think it's crucial. I think the overarching theme is science and data, data and science. And to me, data science will unify all sorts of science treatments. I mean, a lot of people will use very similar techniques to work on their discipline, whatever that discipline is. And the other part of it is that this university will always maintain strong academic cores, but they have to be very porous at the edges academically and open to its interdisciplinarity. And that probably means that our spatial location has to help that process. So we have to kind of not just be siloed off in exclusively one new area or another, while at the same time, we have to give schools in particular a recognizable home and a geographical location where students and staff can find them and feel themselves at home. But at the same time, we want to make sure people can mix and mingle and have the serendipitous stuff and the conversations that arise when you bump into people and that students will find their way around the entire science centre and find it all welcoming and useful and flexible for them. And the interaction around that. We have lots of questions, so many questions coming in for work. Um, here's an interesting one for you uh, to kick off with. How important is it for a learning space to be beautiful or is that even relevant? There you go. <laughs> oh, I think I think beautiful spaces work much better than ugly ones. Yeah. I think ugly spaces tend to dr not encourage people to use them, first of all. And they don't give you that sense of comfort. And they don't encourage necessarily socialization. And learning is a social thing. So I think beautiful spaces are really important. Now, that beauty, beauty doesn't have to necessarily be expensive beauty. <laughs> but it has to be kind of design-led and have that sort of spatial integrity. And just that, yeah. Beauty is good and a view to nature as well, I think is really important in a lot of learning spaces. And the O'Brien Centre has a lot of that already. I mean, if you look at the atrium. Yeah, yeah it's stunning. I mean, mm -hmm. our, our, we are so lucky to work in the most amazing building and I'm sure this project will be equally as as, as beautiful and creative. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get through all the questions in terms of, so this is interesting because it, it relates to last week's speaker who was Katrina Hallahan the MD of Microsoft Ireland. And it's basically saying, you know, from her, 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 um, I suppose, overwhelming thought on, on third level and reimagining the campus experience in light of our pandemic, the current pandemic. So I suppose, how will science, how will this phase three project, I suppose, mold to that? How will it, how will it revision, I suppose, the future in terms, in light of the pandemic? Well, I think the first thing is that nobody really knows what that's going to be, right? What that future is going to be. Yeah. Especially like, you tell me what's going to happen in June 2021, you know? <laughs> I hope we all knew. I hope we'd be all on holidays, but okay. <laughs> you know, it, so it's so hard to read the future. So what you, we have to do as a college and as a university is we have to prepare for flexibility and adaptability. And it seems to me that one of the key ways to that is to make space flexible and generic wherever possible and useful. And in South, for example, uh, the, the chemists have, have said that generally the most the space that's most in demand is the most flexible laboratory space, for example, the most general purpose, not the most specific in its in most uh, fixed in specification. So I think we have to build a building whereby we can adapt to trends and be open to change. I think the idea of um, kind of developing a crust around one's activities, to, as used to happen in, 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 in science and education in general, is probably less tenable going into the future. We have to be a little bit more flexible and agile and ready to change our practices a bit more quickly. Even though UCD has been pretty good at that, I would say, in the last decade or 15 years. Yeah, I think we've been really good at it. And, and I, there's lots of questions around that kind of point, and I'm going to try and fit them in here. So here's one, it's, it's, it's kind of in relation to lecture halls. So what are the do's and don'ts in lecture hall design and lab design? And I suppose we can consider that in light of what you just said in terms of the flexibility. Well, it, it, labs are easier to answer. It's hard to see how you can teach laboratory subjects without students being in laboratories. Yeah. You, you can, you can, they have to be in there for a good chunk of their program. The exact percentage is variable, as we know, even between programs and universities and programs within universities. Large lecture theatres, my current view is that they'll become less significant in the day-to-day -day life of any given student. 
but they're still critical to the, the delivery of the education. So there currently may be modules in science, large the modules would have two or three engagements per module in a big classroom. Maybe that could go to one or two and that extra slot in the timetable will be taken up with asynchronous time or distributed time or collaborative time or more laboratory time indeed, or more flexible laboratory time. I'm not sure that every module will require the same. Now, as I say, I'm not sure, I haven't done all the numbers, but I just don't think that we'll be maybe relying as heavily on everybody being in the same room. Because an awful lot of students aren't comfortable sitting in a room with 300 people. They will never ask a question. They, some of them go asleep. They will never, you know, they might take notes. If you reduce the significance of that, but don't eliminate because you need it, and increase the time where students are able to ask questions and interact in smaller groups with the same material and develop the time in, the, in contact with the content, maybe that will lead to better learning outcomes. Yeah, and actually there's a question very related to what you've just been saying. So these, you know, what we've considered, I suppose, learning in, in terms of these large lecture theatres, but, but, and you've, you've kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, it's, it's some students, there's no interaction. But here's a question along those lines learning it's kind of turning on its head almost learning is a social activity um as you just said and how does that social so how does that social activity survive during the pandemic and online learning well it's really tough i mean even in, in first year labs for instance you know students can't come in this semester into first year lab but yet the demonstrators and the tutors and the staff are working hard to give them data to try and write reports one way we can facilitate it is to have them go into small breakout rooms in twos and threes and discuss the data and jointly write the reports. Okay, so they're still not socializing in the classical sense of being in the same space, but it's better than being one by one in their rooms connected to single person by Zoom. It's really tricky to facilitate that. And I have to say for the long-term campus life, this isn't the case that you know people won't come to campus in general. They might come to campus quite as often, but the bulk of their learning will be on campus. It mightn't just all be in the same room on campus with the rest of their class. That'll happen maybe a bit less often, but they'll need to be here and they need to participate and socialize and gain all the benefits that were in the pre-pandemic university experience. And then maybe some of the ones that are in the post-pandemic university experience will be different, but there'll still be benefits on campus generally. And so, so we've talked a good bit about students. So there's a lot of questions come in around staff and, and there's, yeah. I suppose, a staff wondering what's it going to look like for them. And, and I suppose we were talking earlier about the new report from the government and how 20% of public sector work will be done remotely. Um, but here's a, a very provocative question for you. Uh, the size of a cell in Mountjoy Women's Prison is 11.7 metres squared. What is the plan for phase three in relation to office space for staff well the first thing i'd say is you'll always be able to open your own door from the inside in science phase three <laughs> Brilliant. it's probably going to be less than 11 square meters closer to nine point something uh, for people who have individual offices which will be probably most uh, office provision will still be individual but that number is varying uh, i think that it's 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 going to be definitely not one size fits all in all cases i think there'll be people who choose to work flexibly, people whose life stage suggests that they can't, people whose career stage maybe benefits from being here all the time to kind of learn the ropes and socialize and meet. And then there's other people who may say, well, in fact, I'm going to be, you know, uh, working. I don't have a heavy teaching load this semester. I may choose to spend three days elsewhere working on research and interacting by Zoom if I need to. But yeah, this, the rooms, I mean, my office, the one I'm currently sitting in is about 17 and a half square meters and it's good for two and a half people or three and I have bounded off the office to 9.5 square meters just to see how it feels like it seems to be fine and um, but it is a room on my own in an empty building at the same time so it's not quite a realistic uh, I don't have students coming in for example so it's not quite a realistic comparison but yeah the women's prison uh, yeah, we, you'll always be able to go home in the evening. Yeah, we'll always be able to let them out afterwards. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, so another probably provocative question, but it's 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 uh, interesting in terms of you know different uh, it, seeing space differently, I suppose, going forward. And it's so I'm going to read this out um, it, specifically. I heard recently that it is possible to conduct an audit of a space to see how autism friendly it is. Will one of these audits be conducted? That's the first time I've uh, come across that concept. And certainly we can raise it with the design team. Yeah. Usually they do have a, a, um, a brief to look at 
all types of needs for people. So it's probably in there. I just haven't heard the specific mentioned, but I'll be going back with that question for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's a great question, actually. It's a, if just going forward. And just there's an interesting question from earlier. I'm trying to find it in terms of the funding, just because I, I, I'm mm. realizing we're running out of time, just trying to wrap up. But in terms of the funding, it says the question says, is it predominantly exchequer funded or are we still seeking private donations from corporate organizations? So we have uh, an envelope of funding, say the budget is kind of 90 million, that was the nominal envelope. And we have about um, 25% of that, I guess, raised in terms of uh, philanthropic funding. And then the bulk of the rest, we, there will be government calls for capital infrastructure investment and we'll apply for that. Campus, future campus, gain 25 million from the last round, we would hope to gain something similar in the next round for science. And the rest for them will, will be funded by uh, university borrowing, basically, yeah. and then pay back over the 30 odd years of that loan. Yeah. Okay. And just here's something just to finish because we're completely out of time. It's a, a lovely question. It comes in from Suzanne Shorten and it says, what has Podrick missed the most in the last 10 months? Serendipitous conversations and bumping into people. It's such an easy question to answer, Suzanne. Thanks for that. I should have sent you that before the meeting, but yeah, that's what it is. Just bumping into people. That's the bit that is most missed by me and I think by everyone and probably everyone on this call so unfortunately we are completely out of time and sincere apologies there's still more questions coming in for you for sincere apologies to all of those who whose questions I did not get to I just want to take this opportunity now to say an absolutely huge thanks to you for it thank you so much thank you Patricia thanks and a uh, most fascinating discussion today and thank you to everyone else for joining in uh, you can sign up for the series at zoomforthought.ie and you, where you can also check out our list of upcoming exciting speakers for 2021. Uh, thank you so much again, Pork, and thank you to everyone for joining in and have a great day and I'll see you all next week on Zoom for Thought. Thanks. Thank you.